past decade, there's been a massive change in terms of the availability of solar products in Sub-Saharan Africa. So it was a very niche, rare technology, maybe 10 to 15 years ago. But since this time, there's been this boom in sale of little products from solar lanterns to solar home systems that people can use for lighting and charging phones to, to bigger appliances. Multiple things are at play in driving this boom. I guess on the demand side, you know, people wanting more lighting, but in particular recharging mobile phones was an early catalyst. A lot of people in Sub-Saharan Africa do not have direct access to the electricity grid. Solar products have gotten cheaper, lots of investment going into it, and ex rapid expansion of companies in the sector. So it's a high priority because energy is often seen as quite intersectional. You need access to energy to improve health outcomes. You need access to energy to improve education outcomes, reading in schools, access to computers. So it's often seen as kind of a cross-cutting issue energy that's requirement to meet all of the different goals. Solar, you can install it anywhere. On a mountain, you on the boat, on the lake, where wires you can't reach, you can generate electricity. So that flexibility, makes solar very ideal for supply of energy. So I can show you some of the products that we supply. The latest on the market is called lithium ion batteries. Value for money is the way to use here. You are talking of minimum 10 years before you come back to me. And I doubt if 10 years I'll be there. Somebody is going to replace it for you. So they are very, very good batteries. You know, the market is flooded with fake products, but that's detrimental to the poor Malawians. They will go for a very cheap system and come after two weeks, it can't sustain its life. They will have lost everything. The poorly regulated nature of the market, off-grid market in Malawi, means that there's often poor quality of supply of products. Consumers buying those poor quality products, often not having enough information to go about a proper installation within their homes because uh, they feel they can't afford a certified installer. So what we're finding is that households are often learning as they go along in terms of how to actually construct these systems, what type of panel to buy, what type of battery to buy, what type of inverter to buy, for instance. So it's a process of trial and error and a, a matter of buying these components as and when they can afford it. So it's this kind of constellation of components that form a system. So what we're seeing as we're visiting these households is often really DIY jobs in terms of installation. Ine ni magoza ndi ni magani koko za njinga za moto. Ndi ni kapapanga wiring ku 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 njinga za moto. Ndi ni kapapanga wiring the solar boom is, is framed as something positive, and it certainly has helped to increase certain forms of energy access to many in Africa. But if it's quite short lies in terms of how long these products last, then its green credentials might be questioned if they're only lasting one or two years, and therefore the person on the one hand, needs to go out and buy the infrastructure, the product again. So there's a continual financial burden despite it being renewable energy. And then the second question is waste. So what happens when people stop using these products? You know, they have different potentially hazardous metals and other things inside. Where does this waste end up? They can leach into the soil, affect agriculture, 
kids can play with those products. They can end up at waste sites or landfill. And often you will find that waste sites tend to be closest to the poorest communities. And there's not a lot of infrastructure in Africa to address that issue. Different countries have different capacities and, and different amounts of legislation. South Africa obviously has a much more sophisticated in terms of recycling technologies and ability to control products. Um, but then there's also movement among countries. So a lot of end of life products in South Africa actually end up in other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, in particular in Malawi. And then at the end of lives, these products are moving to different geographies. And, and so we found it quite interesting with the traders from Tanzania, which, which locally they're called the wandering Swahilis, is actually they're coming house to house, knocking, asking for batteries and buying them and putting them on the back of trucks and taking them across the border of Tanzania. So we've got these huge flows of, of solar products moving from Southern to Eastern Africa um, with different uses along the chain. Sometimes local repairers can fix them and give them extra lives. So there's this kind of local knowledge that's emerging about how to extend these products once they've broken in two, three years, which I think is interesting that it's a very much organic and local response to addressing the solar waste issue. Business, you know, was my investor resources, my I and We've identified uh, the repair economy as being a critical part of improving the sustainability of the off-grid solar industry. So how can the re repair economy be uh, encouraged? What incentives can be offered to uh, businesses that are engaged in that space, whether it's through, for instance, access to better spare parts, whether it's through training, whether it's through financing. There needs to be more done also in the upstream of product design. So how can we design products better um, so they can be repaired much more easily? I think it has big implications for the sector that frames itself as being green and producing uh, an ethical good, is that it needs to actually consider its afterlives as a part of its um, responsibility to its customers. <laughs>